In this lecture, I would like to survey some of the different types of biological networks that you will face in the field of systems biology and systems pharmacology. Cell signaling pathways are commonly represented as signed mixed graph, where nodes are mostly proteins, but also can be metabolites, lipids, second, mes second messengers, or peptides. Interactions designate information flow and it can be activation or inhibition. Most of such interactions are direct physical interactions. The interactions are typically enzymatic or binding. There are several pathway databases, including the one that I'm highlighting here, which is signed signaling, but there are others such as wiki pathways, KEG, PID, or biocarta. Typically, biologists are organizing their knowledge about the pathways that they uncover in those diagrams that are called cell signaling pathways. As more information is accumulating about cell signaling pathway, molecular and cell biologists are beginning to realize that the signaling pathway view is limited, since pathways are likely connected to form a large network. For my thesis project, I developed from literature a large-scale cell signaling network. For this, I read many papers, over a thousand papers, describing biochemical regulatory interactions between cellular components in mammalian neurons. I extracted from these papers pairwise cell signaling interactions to form this large-scale cell signaling network you can see in this particular diagram. This network connects ligand receptor interactions to their downstream effectors, and those pathways are terminating at components from different cell machines, such as transcription, translation, secretion, motility, and ion channel regulation. In, if you remember from the first introductory movies that show those various cell signaling pathways, as you can see, the system is much more complex and this is only representing maybe 5 to 10 percent of all the types of components and interactions that are happening in the cell signaling network that controls the cell. So one thing that you can do, you can focus, for example, on one type of interaction. For example, you can just look at protein kinase substrate networks. And those are directed bipartite graph that connect kinases to their substrates through protein phosphorylation. These networks are useful when analyzing data from phosphoproteomics to link detected changes in phosphopeptide levels with the kinase cascade that are responsible for those observed changes. And we will discuss this further along in the course. What I mentioned before, it's very important to understand that we have incomplete knowledge about the connectivity of cell signaling networks. And this makes it difficult to build dynamical models of those systems. In this particular example, Rekha Albert, who was one of those authors of those first seminal uh, papers, which was the scale-free paper, has came up with a, a solution. And she introduced into the network pseudonodes that explain some unfilled, unknown links between known components. It is also common to represent transcriptional regulatory networks with the nodes being merged where the gene and transcription factor are all one node, and the links represent regulatory interactions that include the effect of the transcription factor on the expression and activity of another transcription factor. Ben MacArthur, who was a postdoc in my lab, showed in this study, which he did before he came to my lab, that both embryonic stem cells and osteoblast are regulated by circuits made of nested feedback loops, while the components from each circuit inhibit components from the other positive feedback circuit. Using dynamical simulations, he showed that cells can go from the undifferentiated states to the differentiated states smoothly. However, 
it's very difficult for the cells to go back to the undifferentiated states. The differentiated cells can jump back to an embryonic state. And this is uh, something important for understanding the process of uh, IPS reprogramming. This is another example from Rekha Albert's group. Here what you see, she created a dynamical model that not only connects gene regulatory networks, cell signaling networks, but also interactions between cells. So all the networks that I've shown so far were created manually by experts. However, there are other ways to build networks from the literature. And here I'm showing two examples, a semi-automatic extractions of paper from publications. And this way the software identifies the abstracts that potentially have interactions. And then a user validates and extracts the interactions from the abstracts manually but is assisted by software that highlights the names of proteins and potential types of interactions. There are also completely automated methods to extract interactions from the literature using natural language processing. So, so far I only talked about literature-based networks, but you can also build networks experimentally. And one of the first methods that was used to build those type of networks was is to hybrid screens. So experimentally, protein-protein interactions can be determined in high throughput using the is to hybrid screen system. In the first large-scale is to hybrid screens that identified protein-protein interactions in East, the studies showed little overlap, and that raised concerns about the quality of the method. Regardless of this concern, large-scale studies for mapping protein interactions in other model organism quickly appeared and were published in top journals. This includes mapping of protein-protein interactions in human cells and comparing the identified interactions from is to hybrid methods with previously identified interactions detected through low-throughput methods and reported in many publications and what they found is that there was still very little overlap between the is to hybrid method and the interactions identified in the literature. We will discuss more about protein-protein interactions in later parts of the course. So, so far we looked at direct physical molecular interactions, whether cell signaling interactions, gene regulatory interactions, or protein-protein interactions. However, there are other types of molecular biological networks that can be created that do not require direct physical interaction. And here is an example of an epistasis network from double deletions in yeast. So if you knock down a gene in yeast, you may not get a phenotype and the yeast will grow fine. However, if you knock out two genes, those two genes may cause the yeast to stop growing. And that is an epistasis interaction. You can also infer interactions directly from expression data. This exercise is known as reverse engineering of biological pathways and networks directly from data. In this example above, which is a simple example, time series expression data is used to infer a directed and signed graph based on delayed correlation. Such signed and directed networks can also be created by large-scale multiple perturbation data. And this is another example. So reverse engineering the topology of regulatory molecular biological networks can be done through the analysis of a set of perturbations. And here Karen Schatz et al. reverse engineer the hierarchy of a cell signaling networks using multiple perturbations and a statistical met method called Bayesian networks inference. So all the networks we discussed so far connect molecular components within cells. However, you can also connect the network of a cell to other things. And here is an example of network that connect drugs to their molecular targets. These networks are bipartite graphs containing two types of nodes. 
for example, the FDA-approved drugs and their directed target protein. Nodes in biological networks can be connected through more abstract types of interactions. For example, genes can be connected based on the disease that mutations in those genes can cause. In this particular example, each node corresponds to a distinct disorder colored based on the disorder class. The size of each node is proportional to the number of genes identified as containing mutations that can cause the corresponding disorder. And the link thickness is proportional to the number of genes shared by the two disorders. And this brings us to the next topic, which is functional association networks. Network representation that connects genes and proteins with more abstract concepts can be used for data integration. Anchoring many experiments with the genes identified by the experiments can be used to find dense regions in a bipartite graph of genes and experiments to find defined functional models. And this was done by Tanai et al. when they analyzed the EAST network, not only from a protein-protein interaction perspective, but based on data on knockdown as well as gene expression. We will study later more of the concept of how to construct various functional association networks based on various data types and how those types of networks can be merged to gain knowledge about relationships between proteins and genes.